This is a typical stack that you see. Uh, if you want to take a look at it, I mean, the, in the US, a lot of innovation happened in the government space. Uh, TCP IP, internet, uh, and the last was GPS, uh, which all came into the public domain till the year 2000. And a lot of technology was built on top of these APIs. Uh, and somewhere around 2000, the private sector took over a lot of the innovation. And you had large systems like Google Maps with their APIs, et cetera, come into, space, uh, into place, over which other people built their systems. Uh, in parallel, we had the smartphone revolution, uh, Android and iPhone both came alive in the late 2000s, and uh, very soon they took off, and people started to build on top of that. And separately, payments evolved in its own space, uh, over the last 50 years, you went from cards, and then eventually, till a couple of years back, you came up to Apple Pay. And if you take a look at the startups in this space, I mean, Uber wouldn't be what it is if any one of these layers didn't work. I mean, if Google Maps hadn't happened or GPS, you could not get what is Uber today. Uh, similarly, uh, Airbnb and Amazon have also evolved. I mean, so they started before some of these things, but. But when all of these APIs came into being, they've taken off a, a life of their own. And fundamentally, it's a belief that if you have good, strong infrastructure, people can build technology on top of it and innovate. A lot of innovation is about unbundling, rebundling, and using underlying infrastructure in new ways. And some of these technologies that tend to be reused have this characteristic which we call the hourglass architecture. They have a very thin stem and that allows you to innovate around it. So the API is fixed. At the other side, I can change the implementation or I can change the applications that use it. With TCP IP, it allowed you to build new routers, new ways of transmitting data on one side, and on the other side, it allowed you to build uh, multiple layers, including HTTP, on which the entire web got built. So there's a, uh, so from a very, th but TCP IP itself hasn't changed for Good, God knows, about 50 years now. And, uh, but everything above it and below it has changed. So that is similarly what we think of with Aadhaar, where Aadhaar is a very simple API. It's a very simple implementation. And you can bring in new biometric technologies on one side. You can bring in new kinds of devices, uh, form factors. And then on the other side, you can bring in a lot of applications. And that's. And then these applications can layer on each other in ways that you will find uses that you cannot imagine today. So that is the, uh, and Aadhaar, I mean, it has to be so thin as to you could actually write a law and enshrine it, and hopefully parliament will never touch it again. Because that's the nature of laws, right? Is you want it to be something which you will not modify very frequently. Now, JAM is sort of the, overall trends that we are seeing across the country today. And I'll just walk through each of the layers of that. Uh, we have the Jandhan Yojana, which has led to a massive number of bank accounts being opened across the country. Uh, utilization is still a question of debate, but the goal of getting one account for every household in the country is within reach. Uh, the goal of getting it utilized is probably still some distance away, but this is the first step to that. But at the same time, we are seeing a layering of services on top of this. So if you take a look at the number of uh, uh, deposits, the policies that are being there on it, and eventually overdrafts, we are hoping that will actually start to show utilization. Uh, on the other side, RBI has been innovating in terms of trying to figure out how to get new banks on board. Uh, in 69 and 80 were the last phases of nationalization. And since independence, the first set of new banks that we actually got were in 1993. And then there are two more in 2001. And 2014, you had IDFC and Bandhan come up. And so we are only 14 banks in 49 years. And then suddenly in 2015, they announced licenses for 21 new banks. And the licenses were not the standard full service licenses, but 
two kinds, whether one was the payment bank and one was the small service bank. So they're trying to bring in differentiated banking into place. And that's a new kind of innovation. And hopefully, they've announced on-tap licenses. We haven't seen any yet, but that will allow a lot more competition to come into place. Aadhaar is in the big success story. I mean, we have Dr. Madan here, who was the DG of UIDI for some time. And uh, you know, he saw, I think, the tail end of this growth, where Aadhaar went from, uh, you know, in five and a half years, we went from zero to crossing a billion users. And that growth has been phenomenal. It's actually interesting. There's only about 12 systems globally that have crossed a billion users. Uh, 11 of them are in the US. 11 of them are private. There's only one that's outside the US and government, and that's Aadhaar. Uh, even China doesn't have any systems with a billion users in it. Uh, and this is also the fastest to a billion. Uh, we got them five and a half years from launch. Android took six, and WhatsApp took six and a half. So, you know, we are in good company. And and it's scalable. We can currently do 100 million authentications a day. So that means you can support 100 million auth transactions per day, and it can scale linearly. Today, our utilization is in the range of 5 to 6 million transactions a day. So we are at about 5% of auth capacity. So this is actually scaling very nicely, and we hope to see a lot more users come up. The third trend in Jam is mobile, and I actually want to focus on a subset of mobile, which is smartphones. We are currently at about 200 million smartphones, 200 to 250, depending on who you ask. And we've been tracking at around 25 million a quarter. What that means is by 2020, every adult in the country will have a smartphone. Uh, so going by the trend. And that will change things. That's just about three, four years away. Now, so this is the stack that we talk about, starting from Aadhaar in 2010. The first application of it was financial, the Aadhaar payment bridge, which was used for direct benefits transfer. That was in 2011. And in 2012, the need for eKYC came up, which allowed us to offer a digital version of the Aadhaar ID to people who needed it for KYC purposes. Uh, then in 2015, with the new government we had coming in, the new uh, APIs in the form of eSign and DigiLocker, and those are still uh, starting to grow. And finally, a month ago, we launched UPI, which is the Unified Payment Interface. There's still one piece of work in progress, which is the consent architecture, and I'll talk about that separately. So just to run through, Aadhaar is a 12-digit number. Uh, all of you are aware of it. We collect very little demographic data to go with it. We collect a photograph, 10 fingerprints, and iris. And this is to ensure that we give one Aadhaar per person. This is what ensures uniqueness. And uh, it also then allows us to do a biometric auth later to ensure that it is indeed you who's accessing the service. Aadhaar authentication is a way for you to prove that you are indeed the right person who's accessing a service. Uh, only a yes or no answer is provided. And it can be done anytime, anywhere. And because it's an API, it can be done within the context of a transaction, thus proving that you are part of the transaction. Aadhaar EKYC is an API which, uh, you know, we think of it as the one that's going to eliminate all photocopies. It gives you a digital copy of the Aadhaar card uh, to whoever accesses it based on user authentication. And uh, it's pretty quick and it's the basis for uh, since Aadhaar EKYC is accepted by uh, all the financial sector regulators, it's a way to open bank accounts. So you can actually open a bank account uh, in a few minutes. Uh, one example of it is uh, Reliance Geo, for instance, has launched their program primarily based on Aadhaar as a way to enroll people. Uh, so we expect 100 million people to come onto that platform very, very quickly from Geo. Similarly, Paytm is promising the same thing with bank accounts. And so you'll start to see more and more use cases. In fact, I've personally seen people get, you know, walk into a geo uh, salesperson and get a SIM in two minutes flat, just based on Aadhaar. And the SIM gets activated in another five minutes and you're home. And no paper gets exchanged in the process. 
and uh, so we are beginning to see interesting things appear. E-sign is a digital signature based on Aadhaar. Now, a digital signature in India actually is, yeah. Uh, sorry, just uh, you saying that uh, Leo is, uh, is using Aadhaar. Yes. So, they're adding to the number of transactions every day. Yes, they are. So Aadhaar doesn't know why you are authenticating. Because oh, part of the design was minimal to say, we should not know why you are authenticating. What we do know is who you authenticated through. So the, there is traceability to say that I gave my biometrics to this entity who then sent it to Aadhaar, and then we said yes or no. So that tomorrow, in case there's any dispute, you can track back. So let's say, suppose a bank transaction happened based on Aadhaar, you can at least trace it back to which entity uh, originated the transaction and hopefully that entity can trace it down to the individual terminal where it happened. And then you know, we can have that conversation about fraud or not. But uh, so traceability is built in, but it is split so that Aadhaar doesn't know why you did the auth, what the transaction was. Correct. So, okay, uh, let me step back. I, the hat I'm wearing today and have been for a while is at iSpirit. iSpirit's a volunteer organization. And uh, so we don't run Aadhaar. <laughs> Occasionally I slip into V because uh, part of my history, I was the chief product manager at the UIDI and I tend to talk, say V uh, from yeah. that perspective. But uh, that's I'm no longer part of the organization. So, so now just to point out that 100 million auths a day was sized at on the basis of certain workload, certain hours of the work, a day when the workload would be high, and to handle peak capacity. So even today we could probably go much higher than 100 since the workload is distributed more evenly, uh, and it took us only 10 servers to deliver that. Uh, on the auth side, and it's linearly scalable. We can easily expand the number of servers on demand. So I do expect to see that once the workload starts going up, we will be able to make that happen. So coming to eSign, eSign is a uh, digital signature. The digital signature has two requirements to be valid under law. One is that the data corresponding to the signature should be part of a public database. The second is that the person who's applying the signature has to provably be the same person whose data it is. So Aadhaar qualifies. So what we do is within the context of a transaction, we actually go do an EKYC. We fetch the data from the UIDI. So we know we have valid data in the signature corresponding to Aadhaar. The second piece is we do a, the signature within the context on the uh, CA side so that you know that the same person did the transaction. And then the digital signature is applied, the private key is thrown, the public key is retained in the directory so you can validate in the future. As a result, that key is never reused. Now, this has been notified under the IT Act as equivalent to any other digital signature in the country and hence is valid in a court of law. And so I could actually execute an agreement digitally on the basis of Aadhaar. So that was eSign. And the DigiLocker is uh, a classic uh, PKI infrastructure where you have an issuer who issues a document and signs it digitally, which is then delivered to somebody who's relying on it who can uh, use the digital signature to authenticate it. Except if you think of it as PKI plus a Dropbox, what you provide is actually storage and a indexing mechanism which allows you to share the data uh, based on user authentication. So for instance, I could have my 10th standard mark sheet on the DigiLocker and I could share it with my potential employer and they would know it came from, C uh, from CBSE without me having, uh, and that I had no tampering in the process. 
And this can be done only with user consent because my DigiLocker provider would do that. Uh, this is eventually going to be a federated system. Right now, there's only one locker that's operational. And today morning, we actually had a workshop on potential locker providers, and there were at least 10 of them in the room. And uh, that will actually allow this ecosystem to take off, and we should very soon expect to see a lot more happen. A uh, couple of wins for this system. Uh, this year, the 10th and 12th standard mark sheets from CBSE were placed in the DigiLocker. And they have agreed to do everything for the last 10 years for which they have data in the current database. So from 2004 or 2005, all 10th and 12th standard mark sheets will make their way to the DigiLocker. Uh, the other win they had was with the Department of Motor Vehicles. Uh, both Delhi and Madhya Pradesh, they've ag agreed to put all your driver's licenses and RC books into the DigiLocker. So uh, if you have the DigiLocker app and you are a Delhi resident, you can actually retrieve your RC book and your driver's license. And if you ever get stopped by a cop, you just pull out your mobile phone and show it to them. And the cop, to verify it, there's a QR code. You show him the QR code, and he can verify that it is valid. It's actually built into the app. So you can actually validate the signature on the document and rely on it. So that's live today. I actually have seen it. I can't show it because I'm not a Delhi resident. I don't have any of those. And the unified payment interface. We just launched this uh, earlier in the month. And the system allows you to create a virtual private address uh, behind which you could have multiple bank accounts. And then you can do a send from there, or you can receive money uh, by requesting somebody for money. Uh, this is a layer that's built on top of the existing payment layers that we have. So, uh, And it actually then works in a four-party model. I could have a bank who's providing me with the app, um, a separate bank account, and the party on the other side could be, again, two very different banks. Now, what is the value of UPI? The first is, of course, it's immediate. The second, it allows a push and a pull. I can do a request for money, or I can send money. Uh, it creates a virtual payment address. The party on the other side doesn't know my bank account details. They don't even know which bank it's going to. Um, and it's ubiquitous. It works with bank accounts, which uh, most people are beginning to get. Now, uh, there's no acquirer and issuer cost beyond participating in the system. There's no per transaction cost. I mean, very minimal. It's 50 paise is all it costs in the transaction. And the MDR is, of course, not a cost, but it is you know sort of what it takes to get the banks into the system. But that's and so which is very different than what we have out there. In fact, when we built UPI, after we did the design, we looked at, there's a report uh, in the US where they're asking for improvements to the payment system. And there are a list of pain points, and you could do a checkbox against every one of them with UPI. So I think what we have out there is actually fairly modern, and what you know uh, people are, it addresses all those pain points. You could probably do a second design which does that as well, but this one meets all of those requirements. The last piece is the consent architecture. We believe that we are going into a world where a lot of data is going to be shared. And we want to make sure that the user is at the center of all this data sharing. So the way we think about it is if you were able to put a token which I say, I want to share data about me. This is the data I want to share and with this per entity for this purpose. Then this somebody could take this token to the source of the data, get the data from there, and then keep it for that time um, based on the consent. And then every time the data is accessed, you would log it so it could be audited that the data was being accessed as per the requirements. And this is something which we have been, as an idea which we have been floating out there, it's found some traction uh, within the RBI. It made its way into the NBFC account aggregator norms. And uh, we've been working with the Department of IT as well. And we hope it will make it into a few other places. And uh, it's still early days. We are getting this uh, thought process going. And we hope it will take root. And we will switch to, while we don't necessarily want a very heavy-handed way of doing it, we believe as long as the user is in control of what is being shared and why and for how long and with whom, we are OK. So that's 
the framework that we are looking at. We believe it's consistent with all the frameworks out there, the current legal frameworks. And that brings us to what we call the India stack now. So this is really a presenceless layer which allows us to do a transaction irrespective of where you are, a paperless layer which allows you to do uh, exchange documents without paper, whether it's an ID document or something else. Uh, it allows you to do a signature and share contracts. The cashless layer, which is IMPS followed by UPI, and then on top of it, we have the consent layer. And all of this allows multiple applications to be built on top of it. And I'm going to walk through a couple of those thoughts right now. But before we do that, a bit of the scorecard. Uh, 1.058 billion Aadhaars have been issued over the last six years. 2.6 billion authentications have happened on the system. Uh, 470 million unique Aadhaars have been authenticated. 150 million EKYCs have been done in the last four years. That's about 50 million unique people who have used it. Uh, 320 million people have their bank account linked in the Aadhaar payment bridge. And presumably, they have received at least one DBT transaction because of that which would be the LPG. 320 million accounts have been seeded in the Aadhaar payment bridge. A bulk of this is probably due to LPG uh, subsidies going through there. Uh, at least, I think about five, four or five billion dollars worth of transactions have happened through there. Uh, we have had over one million e-signs in the last 15 months uh, since the launch of e-sign. And the DigiLocker, which is operated by NIC, has about 25 lakh users, and they've put about 37 lakh documents in there already. And you know, we think it's a ecosystem. There's a lot of parties in this. I mean, we have 20 banks on UPI. We have about slightly less than 800 banks on the Aadhaar payment bridge. On APS, we have 126 banks. It's a different number because the, there are cooperatives, there are uh, RRBs, etc. Some who have done it, who have not done it. Uh, DigiLocker, there's only one provider right now, which is actually the, a government department, NEGD, has that. Uh, the three e-sign providers today, uh, 23 uh, KSAs and uh, 160 KUAs, and on the auth side, you have 25 ASAs and about 250 AUAs. And I believe there's almost as many more in the process of being approved. So this number should double within the next two months. And as a result, we will go from data poor to data rich. I mean, there's going to be a lot of uh, digital trails happening out there. This is a story which has been told. And why is this stack disruptive? Because we believe it allows a broad-based innovation. It is ubiquitous. Almost every one of these APIs could touch everybody in the country. It cuts onboarding costs, we remove paper, we bring costs down significantly. It cuts transaction costs, uh, removes physical presence. And the cutting costs part actually we believe aligns the market goals with social goals of inclusion. If I'm able to service a customer uh, with a very low onboarding cost, I'm likely to service a lot more customers. I'm likely to go after them and bring them into the system. Well, on the other hand, a subsidy doesn't really do that. And we believe that this also increases trust. The use of a real ID like Aadhaar, along with digital systems, is actually a trust builder. And we are a very low trust society. And this actually will start to transform the way we think about how we interact with each other and with systems. So the classic example really is credit, of how we can do credit in this manner. And today, you know, so we use this example of a daily wage uh, person who gets up in the morning, goes, buys goods on credit, uh, does sales, then at the end of the day pays back the loan. And they typically get an intraday loan at anywhere between 1 to 5 percent. And they cannot go to the formal system for a loan because the cost of sales servicing is very high and there's no credible data about them. On the other hand, we think that we can change that. So we sort of said, what would it take for Rajni, as you call her, to get a loan. She would have to say she needs a loan. She should agree to share data. She should see loan offers, accept the best offer, have a payment instrument to accept the loan, and then do the business and repay it at the end of the day. All on a smartphone without going to a bank. To do that, she needs a credit marketplace app. She needs her consent architecture to be in place. 
she needs paperless contracts to do the execution she needs the payment application and the accounts and all of this is feasible with the stack using aadhar and ekyc you can open the account the digi locker can be used to share data uh, the credit marketplace is its own base but then e sign and digi locker can provide for the paperless contracts and upi provides a transaction piece so we asked the question can we do this so we actually did a pilot we got a whole bunch of folks excited and the reason we did this by the way is we wanted to go cashless and the belief which we could not test in this pilot was that cashless is the uh, sorry credit is the hook to cashless if you believe that going cashless and paperless will give you digital footprints which will give you a loan which will allow you to grow your business and pull you out of poverty every street vendor is want to, going to want you to say paytm card right that's really what it is is to say if that is their belief because the entire country is so credit starved that if you you can do this you will actually get that cycle going we strongly believe this we are unable to test this in the pilot because it is still early but that's what we wanted to do and so we think this is one use case which will take off and it will be good for everybody the thing is that this will now enable credit at scale because you will have millions of borrowers thousands of lenders coming through credit marketplaces there's at least three credit marketplaces i know that are coming up so it's going to be interesting um and investments is another place where we worked with sebi where uh, we know that sebi uh, mandates a 50 basis points uh, fees to the distributor max and if his onboarding cost for a customer is and they say it is somewhere between 1000 and 1500 rupees they'll only go for customers who are going to invest 2 lakhs to 3 lakh rupees in the first year and that means they will only operate at the top of the income pyramid which is 3 million households with uh, income above 17 lakh rupees a year that's the top 3 million households in the country who are on the stock market today they won't go after the next year which is 3.4 to 17 lakh rupees income or the one below that on the other hand if through this process if we can bring the onboarding cost down to 50 rupees or 10 rupees as we believe is possible then we will disrupt it funds the reason why the maids and drivers and the poor folks go to chit funds is because no stock market distributor comes and allows them to get a good return on their money the only thing which offers them anything is the chit funds which say there's no cost you come on board i'll take your money uh, most of the times you'll be lucky and you'll get it back occasionally there'll be a scam and you'll lose everything but the reason they are in the informal system is because it works and the formal system doesn't go out to them if by bringing the costs down we can get them into the formal system and the safety and security it offers they will come in and so that's what we hope we are going to be able to do and we actually worked with sebi to make it possible to open an account completely cashless paperless then we had a bit of a hiccup in the form of central ckyc uh, regulation came out that put us back now we are working to get past that again but we hope in the next 6 months this will be live again so this is a second use case which we think is on that edge one regulation we need to fix and we'll be done um transaction costs will come down with upi and we hope that there will be no mdr on investments and then in that case it's 50 50 paise transaction and not a 5 rupee 50 rupees right now they pay the net banking world about 15 to 20 rupees for a transaction if they're doing a nach or those kind they're paying 20 to 30 rupees per transaction i've heard for checks they pay 50 rupees so if you're doing a sip kind of a plan and they're paying 50 rupees per they don't want anything under 10000 rupees because they only get 50 bips so so that's the costs that are there and if we take those costs out this is really the thesis to increase market size 10x 100x you bring the cost on that much you'll see it happen uh we believe skills is another place where this can happen because today somebody comes as a security guard you have no idea how much training he has how much experience he has any certificates he produces are worthless you don't trust them so there's no differentiation of income based on skills and experience on the other hand if you were to trust 
uh, you had credible history, you were able to then give differentiated earnings because if you are more skilled, you get better earnings. If you have a certificate I can trust, I pay you more, then people will go in for additional skilling and so on. And if you are able to make that happen, then we'll hopefully change the scenario as well. So this is where the low trust to high trust comes in. If you're able to trust in the system, then things will change. So this is another, we're looking for the right use case in this where we can do an adoption sprint or a pilot and make it happen. We think there's something similar waiting to happen in healthcare and multiple other places as well, where people are looking at ID as a way to tie together health records and uh, so on. So this, Multiple conversations, nothing which I can point to yet, but I do believe that the, this goes well beyond finance. Though finance will be the first space to uh, adopt. And that's pretty much it. What we believe is that this is digital infrastructure. We would love to enable hundreds of experiments and that will, some of them will succeed. Many will fail. But the ones that do should help solve our problems. That's really what you know, is driving this whole thing. So we just want to enable more and more experiments to happen. So.